All right, it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce our last speaker, Lenore Manderson. Lenore Manderson is a distinguished professor of public health and medical anthropology in the School of Public Health at the University of Witwatersrand. Um, she's also visiting distinguished professor at the Institute for Environment and Society and visiting professor of anthropology at Brown University, as well as honorary professor at Konkan University in Thailand and adjunct professor at Monash University. Madison has made uh, major contributions to medical anthropology, uh, social history, and public health, uh, studies of gender and sexuality, infectious and chronic disease, disability and inequality. Among um, 20 books, I'll just name Sickness and the State, <laughs> Health and Illness and Colonial uh, Mal Malaya, 1870 1940, Surface Tensions, uh, Surgery, Bodily Boundaries and the Social Self. Technologies of Sexuality, Identity, and Sexual Health. During the last few years, uh, Lenore has been curating a set of international collaborations across the natural and social sciences, humanities, and the arts called Earth Itself, including a, the 2015 Thinking the Earth, 2016 <coughs> Atmospheres, 2017 What Fire Does, and 2018 Water's Edge, initially at Brown and also now at the University of the Witwatersrand. Around. Her talk today is called Earth Itself, experiments with writing a warmer world. Mm. Okay. Welcome, Lenore. Thank you. Um, thank you so yes. much. It's, it's just been such an amazingly and wonderful, rich day with, with so many provocative and inspiring talks. So I'm beginning to feel like, you know, 5.30 in the afternoon when you watch cartoons on TV or a kind of summary of the week before going to dinner, that I'm the summary of the week or going to dinner person. <laughs> um, what I'm going to call cartoon time. Um, what I'm actually going to talk about is the work that I have done, so it's really descriptive, and at the same time r raise questions around reading as well as writing Earth using different media, and I've been inspired to think about reading as we've been, as I've been listening today. I am going to read much of this and towards the end I'll do a bit more talking. My friend and earth writing collaborator Forrest Gander referred me to W.A. Jordan, which I realise in this group is a pretty conventional person to be raising. But what Auden has always quoted as saying is poetry makes nothing happen. Hmm. Actually, Auden said much more than this and if I can patch the text to suit my purpose, he wrote, Poetry makes nothing happen, it survives. <laughs> a way of happening, a mouth. Forrest actually elaborated on this too, adapting Auden to write art, science writing or essays make nothing happen. But Auden began this section, which was in memory of Yeats, with the sentence, Mad Island hurt you into poetry. So, Mad Island then, Mad World now. And then the rest of the verse makes sense for us, so I read this somewhat tweaked with apologies and gratitude to Auden and my friends. This mad world hurt you into poetry, and now the planet has its madness and its weather still, for poetry makes nothing happen, it survives. In the valley of its making, where executives would never want to tamper, flows on south from ranches of isolation and the busy griefs, raw towns that we believe and die in, it survives, a way of happening, a mouth. It is no longer true that executives would never want to tamper, of course, they do so all the time. But now, also, at the same time, they, whoever we want to include, refuse to tamper, or rather, they will only tamper or plunder in one direction. And in this there is some kind of stasis. They render science irrelevant. I read this and I feel a chill. It is a provocation for me not of the impotence of writing, but of its imperative. In, 1920, in 2014, I joined Brown and the University of the Bitsfattestrand at the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society to work there at the intersections of the creative arts, humanities, and social and natural sciences. As a result, as Sharad has already mentioned, from 2015, Ibis presented a program entitled Earth Itself, designed to unsettle silos and disrupt taken-for-granted ways of knowing 
and to facilitate conversations and collaborations across these domains to highlight and contrast contributions and ways of understanding earth systems and elements, environmental change, knowledge systems and policy, so to address the most complex problem of our time. In doing this, I drew on the classic elements of each year's theme, and I'll come back to what these images are in a moment. Classic Greek, Babylonian and Buddhist categories, at least. I coupled themes and form, hence earth, dance, air, music, sound, fire, fire out, water, text. Mm. It, and this is just mm. to give you an idea of both the, the Buddhist and um, mm -hmm. Galenic ways of knowing the earth. In 2015, the scholarly program, Thinking the Earth, Ways of Knowing Modes of Care, attended to indigenous ontologies, stewardship and custodianship, earth as a commons, with the irony that it really is, so land ownership. The program included a scholarly lecture mm. by Kikui Ka'alini Ilana Ka Ole O Hahalini, in, um, who is um, not drawing not on her work on the use of GIS in Hawaii to map ecological changes, but to speak of the vocabulary of hula as inherited right. by her mother, or right. from her mother, she now mm -hmm. owns this hula tradition. Mm -hmm. um, the August main, main hall of the John Carter Brown Library at Brown was transformed, mm -hmm. and I could be, will never be the same. Kukui's lecture was complemented by the work of other dancers working with the dance practice of contact improvisation mm. directed by Shira Baryshnikov who, who choreographed and performed aftershock sampling impact. And I just want to talk about this because it has a very nice resonance um, with, with the talk that we began. On a sprung wooden floor Shura had samples of wet clay, and as the dancers danced on the clay, they left the heavy impressions of their bodies mm -hmm. as they landed on it. And the relationship of that was the, round, the, the raised feet mm -hmm. where Gandhi walked, which is impossible because footsteps mm -hmm. on a path indent into rather than float upon. In any case, this work really provided a powerful metaphor of our footprints on the earth literalised in the performance, although not necessarily recognised as such by most who watched it. In 2016, mm. I seem to have lost an image in... What? Sorry, mm. there's an image there which is, has dropped out. In 2016, the program was Atmospheres, Science, Art and the Air that Sustains Us, <coughs> which turned to wind energy, air pollution, storms, allergies, and vector-borne disease. Mm. The keynote was by Mwani Gituru, who you see here, a Kenyan ornithologist turned environmental activist working across Africa and beyond at community levels on the conservation and enhancement of forest carbon stock and the sustainable management of forests. Mm. At the same time, the art, through collaboration with Ed Osborne, who's a, a musician and sound artist of Brown, included work such as the, um, well, you can read these and then I'll move it on. Um, the, no, I won't, I need to flick it through. Um, the, sound, the sound art in the, the, the top, your left-hand corner, is a picture of the greenhouse at the top of the building in which I work at Brown. And the greenhouse, um, Jim Moses, working with me, sounded up using an old 1970s analogue and then translating that and digital sound um, so that when one walked out of the lift on the fourth floor, you could hear the sound of um, analogic variations of the noise of a forest, so mm -hmm. sounds of crickets and birds and frogs and so on. It included found sound and acoustic ecology also, um, and I'll play something momentarily. It included the work of Leah Barclay, who used a mobile app um, to allow people across the campus to 
um, flick on and access the sound of forests. And this is a sound artist from Australia who's working with, in multiple UNICEF biospheres to record sounds of the river, that is, under the water, not over the water. Mm. And what, what both of them and, and the other sound artists, and there were um, uh, four sound artists in total were doing, was then exploring the ways in which vir virtual technologies and recordings can engage communities around the creative and the scientific poss possibilities of ecosystem monitoring. And in that context, um, I'm just going to try and find, because this is not going to work, right? Um, no, never mind. Um, the answer was it was really easy, and all I had to do was press. Um, <laughs> okay, that's hysterical. What? So, and I was already saying how ridiculous that nobody, people in this room, were struggling with this technology, and I've just proven that I included. If at some stage, some, can can you get? Because I would like to play right at the end a couple of pieces. Okay. If you can, um, <laughs> so, oh no, sort it out later if you know how to do it. And um, we'll come back to it. But but what I want you to do is to listen mm. to some of the sounds that people were doing. Mm. Um, the third year was Let's what see. fire does, oh, and what fire does focused on fire as productive and destructive, transformative and creative, with the scholarly program extending from early modern manufacture, paleogeological and archaeological evidence um, of fire and human movement, as well as industrial pollution. Sorry, sorry I'll pause on this. I press down. You, yeah. you do it for me. <coughs> well, why, did I, yeah, why did I not do that? Okay. <laughs> so now it's no, it's, it's both. <coughs> we'll do it later yeah, and I'll play it, it loudly. And then double on. So well, let's go back to this. Um, so looking at um, from very early evidence of human movement via the remains of fire in the substrata through to um, more recent um, material culture, industrial pollution, wildfires and firefighting. In collaboration with the Music Department of the Brown Arts Initiative, and with Barnaby Evans and the Water Fire Festival, we held a competition for students to compose music for that festival, playing on the idea of fire. The arts program included the fire arts, and that's partly what this visual is about. Mm -hmm. The fire arts were at RISD, um, and, and, we, and it was really a performance of about um, one and a half hours of students from that department demonstrating that the the second um, work, and again we seem to have lost an image in, in its transfer, was the work of David Katz in the ceramics department, um, whereby David was juxtaposing both wet and fired and unfired mm -hmm. clay. Mm -hmm. So what you can see there is that over time the unfired clay cracks. And so this was installed in a huge room with a double story ceiling because there's a mezzanine upstairs, um, the osteology lab, and the osteology lab became a, a performance space. Hmm. Um, the um, actual program was launched in the nature lab, so people had canopies and drinks um, around um, the um, uh, taxidermied animals and so on. <laughs> <laughs> In 2018, we'll see if this works. This one may well work. Okay, this was truly all tested. I just want to keep it a bit low. Um, I'll try and talk over this for a little bit and then I'll turn it off. In 2018, we did water. Okay, let me hold it there. We, the planet and all living things in it, are composed of, exist, and are only because of water. Water is everywhere, and yet visible only through its impurities, refractions of light, reflections of solid images. 
Water is fundamental to all life forms, and life on Earth is vulnerable because of threats to water's pre predictability or unpredictable threats to its predictability and its renewability, its quantity and quality. We need it for food and for everyday living. Without it, life cannot be sustained. Water is quotidian, ubiquitous, precarious and precious, as I am so often reminded as a citizen of one and a resident in another country, Australia and South Africa, countries that weave their histories and politics around water's scarcity. In 2018, the art form was text. Water's Edge included research presentations, installations and literary arts panels on polarity, the ontology and the polarity is around the, the ontology of water and ice, around surface and depth, liquid and solid, and the ocean as passage. It explored water and text in relation to storms and disasters, water insecurity, and marine and riverine environments. Here, art and science merged, and over two days, the people who spoke were those who wrote about water and the environment, not only as academics, that is, not using scholarly conventions to write of hydrology or of the politics of water insecurity, the decline of ice sheets or drought, but through the freedom of creative text, creative nonfiction, fiction and poetry. Forrest Gander, who gave me the Auden quote, and I invited creative nonfiction writers from a range of genre to read their work and to reflect on the challenges of capturing the nature of water in language. In association with these scholarly panels, we included poetry readings. Through these media and knowledge and appreciation of the natural environment, the elements, the complexity of form and function, stewardship, custodianship, and assaults, these all became accessible to a wider public. And as in previous years, the program included things like a student poster and short PowerPoint presentation competition, academic symposia and keynote lectures, a film festival each year, theatre performances and other activities, including an exhibition held at the John Carter Brown Library each year on a parallel project exploring the four elements. It, this year, that is at Brown, there was also a collaborative program entitled Polar Opposites, focusing on rising temperatures, loss of sea ice, and the melting of ice sheets in the Antarctic and Arctic, provided by the Brown um, Arts Initiative. It included a keynote speaker, David Buckland, who founded the Cape Farewell Project and is well known for his art around the Arctic and increasingly working with indigenous communities to map the environment. Water's Edge also included an exhibition at the David Winton Bell Gallery, um, 33 Degrees, which included Isfold, the work of Danish sound artist Jacob Kierkegaard, an, of an underwater field recording of caving icebergs in Greenland, which I won't play, because we'll have the same problem. <laughs> I want to draw on a book by Maggie Nelson, a critical studies scholar and poet. The book, Bluet, is a mix of 24 posed paragraphs of memoir and philosophy that are as visceral as stanzas of poetry, the words written to be rolled around the mouth. Their prosody breaks the boundaries by which we differentiate literary forms, including the broadest categories of fiction, fact and science, art. The book helped me reflect on the sessions on writing on water that were parts of Water's Edge. Bluet is amusing on colour and to an extent on its familiar metaphoric uses, on mood for instance. It is really about the blue of water though. And of course water is only sometimes blue. It is also green and white and indigo and black. And in the end, clear, a colourless element that takes its hue from the environment of which it is part, or of what lies up under it or floats in it. To write about water is to write about how it feels and tastes, 
and how it acts, how it sounds, what it draws us into a wide environment. In stanzas 200 and 201, Nelson alludes to Heraclitus, as we often do when we write about water. You can't step in the same river twice, or alternatively, we step and do not step into the same river. We are and we are not. The point is one of elusiveness and illusion, time, place and space. Water is an element that is always changing, and we in relation to it. In South Africa, where water's edge morphed into watershed, mm. blue water, fresh surface and groundwater, in the language of, wa of a water footprint of environmentalists, environmentalists, and green water, rainwater gathered on the surface or stored in soil, is rare. Grey water in Australia is water for reuse. In the language of the water footprint, it means something else the amount of water that is polluted that might need to be offset by other water. Mm. In South Africa, there will really be enough blue water to balance the grey. Mm. Water, non-toxics, oh no. Oh. Right, this is an image, I'm going to describe it to you, <laughs> of, <laughs> of large chemical um, uh, containers um, with acid mine drainage water, which is um, the colour of Eleonora's coat, actually. It's that russety colour. And he did this extraordinary installation at a place called the Samolahong Precinct, um, mm. using water um, in these containers, but also with speakers capturing the sound of the oscillation of the molecules mm -hmm. of the water over time as it changed in response to light and to sitting in these containers. Mm. So water, non-toxic, non unpolluted and potable, is scarce. Instead of grey and blue, water is red and orange and brown. Russet red, sienna and ochre tones of iron residue and other heavy metals, the verdigris hue of copper. Colour is always a warning sign. Red, orange and green are all stop. But this is not to say there is no water, and Watershed played on this with multiple ironies. Mm. The main title borrows from the, high, from the fact that the campus sits at its highest point, where the campus crosses a freeway from east to west, mm. and where art and basic sciences also cross over to meet with engineering and commerce at the site of the origin centre. Here, on one side, water falls to the southeast into the Limpopo drainage system and out into the Indian Ocean. On the other side, water runs northwest into the Vaal, then to the Orange River, eventually to flow into the Atlantic. Somewhere deep under the land on which we walked, as we crisscrossed from exhibitions and seminars, water was seeping away. Meanwhile, though, Johannesburg is dry, and the poorer the neighbourhood, the drier, the greyer it is. The city buys its water from Lesotho in part, and it gets all of its electricity from Lesotho through hydroelectricity. Lesotho, for those of you who don't know it, is an impoverished landlocked country to the south. Its main goods is water. Um, in the same year that I, this year, that, uh, that I did watershed, this was the year after three years of drought when Cape Town just avoided day zero. Mm. The rains began to fall just before tap water had become unpotable sludge and the green lawns on the rich side of the mountain had dried out. Mm. Crisis averted, still Cape Town provided us with an immediacy to interrogate the pervasive challenges of decolonisation and ecological shifts for modes of governance, custodianship and representation. And so watershed was an apt metaphor, a decision point to manage this resource and to protect life, with all the economic and political implications this suggests. 
drawing on the form and the synergies of art and science developed in Earth itself at Brown, at FITS I worked with colleagues from across campus and across faculties and departments, mm. bringing together artists, researchers, policy scientists, NGO activists and um, students to worry away at contemporary global yet distinctly local questions of climate change, pollution, the commodification of nature, ecology and environmental justice. Subtitled Art, Science and Elemental Politics, Watershed was always about social justice. It was the ideal element to illustrate and analyse the appropriation and privatisation of a commons, to track historical, colonial and apartheid injustices, to map persistent contemporary inequalities, to question the power of law, the crises in governance and government, the power of forecasting, and the ways in which we might make decisions to avoid future crises. And so Watershed was a vehicle to examine through poetry, book reading, seminars, dance and performance art, sculptures and paintings, across the arts and between art and science, the nexus of decolonisation, ecology and public institutions in the context of South Africa's increasingly volatile political and environmental landscapes. We took South Africa's trajectory from a colonised space to a landscape riven by apartheid, to a nation that now fosters powerful decolonising forces in the context of drastic ecological transformation. We questioned how water came to be a question of profit, as we undid ideologies of the natural and the free in a time and place of neoliberal greed. The meeting points of art and science Aesthetics and politics thus converged at different points. And mine is a picture. Um, this one actually is for Andrea, um, though I didn't know it would be. Um, one of the things that we did, the building where Atul Bala's um, work was, which was a giant mm -hmm. installation in that building in, in the lower ground basement is a digital mine that allows you to walk in and experience what a mine might be like. And I, and so this this was really at the beginning, and it was quite extraordinary the way in which people moved mm. to grab access to this kind of material. And the reason we included the mine is the use of water in mining. And mm -hmm. while um, somebody mentioned um, lack of go gold running out on, um, you did actually, it's not entirely true. And thousands of people around Johannesburg mined for gold, mm -hmm. the irony being that the majority are 18 to 20 year old Zimbabwean young men without papers, mining disused or theoretically closed mines. And the mining, because it's quite old, the underground mining um, is in pockets, so it's mm -hmm. like a honeycomb. And the top of the earth is held up by the pillars, the earthen pillars of unmined dirt. Mm. And what the Zamazama, the, these miners are doing, is mining the columns. Mm. So what they're of course doing is undermining yeah. the earth itself. Mm. The um, poetry and writing, um, Jacqueline Cock presented, um, talked about her book, which is a, a biography of a river, and I've, I've heard numbers of people since then talk, use that expression, and what does that mean to write a biography of a river? Um, Yvette Christian says some people um, may well know has been working on slave registers, and um, she has some extraordinary poetry that referenced the slave registers. She was speaking at a time when there was considerable controversy around the history on the ocean and the mm. history of slavery and South Africa's role, both as a as a stopping point and a distribution point mm -hmm. for people who were slaves. And few artists were involved in um, uh, walking through um, the environment mm. and doing performance pieces. So this is one of them. The picture that you saw earlier of um, wooden, wooden sculptures of a hyena is in fact, um, that was an exhibition and that the, the artist who did that work, the, the hyenas on the watershed were actually having an early morning walk and, and which we could show using stop frame mm. animation. 
um, since they were only mobile by virtue of that technology, but she was also doing walks along the watershed. Um, Zen Marie had a film called Paradise Fallen, which is really a film about water taken offshore from Dhaka, Senegal, where he had um, a residency. Mm -hmm. Mark Lewis's work, which is photography mm -hmm. of marks on the rocks of mm -hmm. riverbeds, um, which are extraordinarily beautiful. Hanley's picture of the hyena. I can't believe this is happening. Um, yeah, Atul Bala, I'd like to talk about this and, and, and because I, I think it's an incredibly <coughs> um, important piece of work. The engineering building at Fitz has three wings and the wings come to centre in an atrium, a, a very, very large space with a um, 14 metre ceiling and then um, a cone glass ceiling. And what you can see, he screened the entire centre of the atrium with the with something like 18 giant screens, which he produced from photographs he'd taken of the soil around the mines where the Zamazama were working, so that the reddishness is from acid mine drainage. Um, and remember, this is in the in the, the chamber of mines with a digital mine downstairs. So the mining engineers were uh, taken aback by it, the, which was the point. There were <laughs> photographs, um, and there were in fact five very large photographs um, printed on um, canvas about the size of this screen. The um, metal pieces in the centre, the punduka, are used to rinse the dirt with gold, what is, what is retrieved is not nuggets usually, but just small pieces of gold. Mm -hmm. Most of that gold, I have to point <laughs> out, is sold not necessarily through formal channels, but it's sold to India to become mm -hmm. things like bangles. Mm -hmm. And so Atul re-imported South African gold to put gold leaf on the Panduka. Um, so there's all kinds of little um, political jokes in mm -hmm. this work. And these were bumper bar stickers, stickers, both in English and in Zulu, with the translation mm -hmm. underneath, which were really poetry that he had written in response to this environment, to the acid mine drainage, to the conditions under which people worked there. This work is the work by Christine Dixie, who's a South African artist. And these, this work is... Um, print on brushed metal and behind mm -hmm. it is a second layer of, of, of um, material which is a polymer printed with, with water. Mm -hmm. And the, the um, blue lines that you can see are in fact a diagram of what a fracking system looks like mm -hmm. into the earth. And so this was an intervention around fracking, mm -hmm. um, which is deeply contentious, the Karoo Desert um, there's been big debates around fracking there and questions around so where does the water even come from and why would one opt for um, power through that vehicle. Um, this piece is done by a Peruvian artist who used um, Watershed as a starting point for a collaboration that will involve both Peru and South Africa, Peru being um, and Lima especially being one of the driest cities in the world. And what she has been interested in is both water vehicles. These, uh, these water collection, these buckets <coughs> and so on are all would fit in the palm of my hand, so they're micro. The plants are much bigger and of course they're artist versions of plants, but with um, highlighting the way in which plants capture water, that one has got those discs are actually fog catchers. So in the Namakwa Desert, mm -hmm. plants have adapted to be able to capture water even mm -hmm. from um, the slightest change in the environment. And this one, which is what I'm going to end with, um, is called Pushing Against the Shed, um, which re references obviously the watershed. And this is a large ball like a giant fit ball in which there were some over a hundred litres of water. And the incline from the bottom, from gate seven, Sharad, up to the origin centre um, is quite steep. And so Marcus mm -hmm. began by pushing it up the hill. 
And as but there's a hole in the in the ball, so the further he got, the more the water leaked out. Mm -hmm. And the more the water leaked out, the more collapsed the ball was, the harder it was to push it because mm -hmm. you rely on the tension mm -hmm. of, of, yeah. of a tight ball to make it mobile. Mm -hmm. um, this was a 40-minute performance, and you can see sort of the energy involved in that. Um, and by the end of it, he was sitting in tears. Um, we live streamed that through the reception and live streamed it also into the foyer of the building I work in at Brown at the same time and then mm. it went online. So that of itself, and of course, you know, that's a very obvious metaphor. It goes back to my point about reading. I mean, this is around, I mean, how do you read a piece of, uh, read, read a work of art? This one's obvious around dealing with climate change in the context where there is so much political resistance and it is, you know, pushing uphill um, and, and, and the impossibility of, of doing that particularly successfully. Um, other work was more optimistic and we did have some quite extraordinary discussions with colleagues around um, the, the collaborations between art and science, but of which one, which I was mentioning to someone before was um, one of the scientists was saying, well, he just didn't understand some of the art. You know, I mean, he he um, he looked at it and it just didn't mean anything. And one of the artists said, you know, I look at science sometimes and I think, you know, I see what it's doing, but I know like what I like and just re inv reversed or, or inverted that kind of criticism, you know, like um, anyone can do it and so on. And it was that kind of thing. Um, but the result has been um, <coughs> that there's been, um, that we have generated through it um, some extraordinary discussion around um, global warming and around water as, in particular as a resource. And I've put this up, but I do want to do one last closing show off, which is that in the course of it, we, we I mean, we had. We, um, a number of breakfast radio sessions I had full when I was talking about this and publications in newspapers or the general newspapers but um, I also did a piece for Conversation mm -hmm. The Conversation, The Conversation Africa so for those of you not familiar with it it's a um, um, weekly um, uh, journalistic style like an op-ed um, journal um, that academics write for. What I didn't know is that it could be reproduced without going back to the author. Mm. So my writing around global health, global warming and health got republished in Plumbing Africa Online <laughs> and nobody I know as an academic has ever published in Plumbing <laughs> Africa Online. <laughs> okay. that's just, uh, gone. So that's it and I'll just see if I can play quietly stuff some one of the sound files if there's any questions. Thank you, Lenora, for those some questions in this time. Mm. We're getting tired. Getting tired. Mm. Mm. It's just amazing. Yeah, just okay. So I'm happy to answer questions, and we're just going to try and get this to play. Come back, it's not playing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not seeing anything. See the loads. Yeah. Okay, we'll, all right. Any questions in the interim while it's loading? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So this is some of the work which I hope will start playing um, by Brian House, who's the person who did the acid mine drainage work. Mm -hmm. There's a question over there. So, are you? Yes, I'm listening. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. I'm Thank focused. you for the wonderful <laughs> presentation. It's very, um, very good to know that these kinds of events are happening, but seemingly mostly on university campuses, mm -hmm. and um, and that's certainly true in, in the United States. It doesn't really travel far beyond the university campuses, sadly, except there's mm -hmm. some exceptions. So I. I was wondering well, what the situation is more in South Africa, given you've said three years of drought. I mean, is this kind of art and work that you're, you're dealing with migrating? I mean, you've published in Plumbing Africa. <laughs> you know, how, how is it circulating? How 
Oh, I'd like to think that plumbers now quote me whenever they are, try and fix a tap. Um, I mean, I don't think, I mean, it, it happens on a, you know, it's not as if lots of us are doing or have the space and the privilege to do this kind of curating. I mean, yeah. I've been paid, I have another one next year. So, and then South Africa want, wants, wants to move into a every second year on an ongoing basis in collaboration Amazing. with others. So um, I've sort of started something there, um, you know, and it is certainly in South, South Africa, it was, it was intense. So I've said every second year. In next year at Brown, I'm doing, um, a project called Blue Sky, mm. Agility and the Possible in a Warming World. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and in relation to that, it, it goes back to the discussion about science fiction, that um, one of my starting points for that was, you know, the should, should we go or should we stay? And, mm -hmm. and the, idea, the Elon Musk fantasy that you just hop in a big, big you know, spaceship and, and <laughs> you know, the rest of the Earth be damned. But I actually want to take that provocation seriously and also try and get um, some, some positive thinking. You know, I've been deeply shocked by the mood of a number of the young scientists I work with at um, Brown in response to the climate change um, report that came out, the world's now 1.5. And they were like, okay, well, we'll just all give up, and and I, we can't afford to. Not the least of which is we can't afford to allow the government of the day to determine the rest of our lives. And and this person's not going to be government of the day forever, even if it sometimes feels it. Um, and so it is, it is about provocation. It is around, you know, a um, an activist component um, of of you know what, what I'm interested in, and I'm just trying now to sort of theorise back on what I've been doing and how it works and what the relation, I mean, I've worked with artists really for the last 20 years, including in relation to this. Um, but, you know, to take it into this kind of domain, and it's not you, but, you know, you said, well, it's university, but I think even when it's university, there's an outreach. So at Brown, I was working across universities with RISD and with Brown and with Waterfire Festival, which is the big fortnightly event through um, May through to November there. So, you know, and it was being picked up in papers in South Africa. I mean, I have to tell you, the drive, drive time breakfast radio on three, di four different stations was is, is pretty good in terms of getting people mm -hmm. to talk about it. And what was amazing was, in fact, the people would say, oh, do you know about... So it, it did travel mm -hmm. and, it, and we had several articles in newspapers that made it on the big posters as a result of it. Now, the, the advantage of that was actually having an awfully committed media person in the university, which one doesn't necessarily get all the time. But I think it, it's, it's because of the inspiration. And, and, you know, I mean, I found often things that didn't get such publicity, and it takes a long time to grow that. Well, that was the purpose of Cape Farewell and David Buckland's work, how do you build a momentum where you are getting people to talk across different registers in different media, and it's true for groups like, say, Julie's Bicycle in the UK and the whole notion there of the tipping point and the coalitions between artists and, um, uh, and academics of different genre. Um, but, I mean, look, this one was, the South Africa one was wonderful just because we had engineers and artists and me from medicine collaborating in, mm -hmm. in ways that just hadn't happened historically. So mm -hmm. that was good. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. This work sounds really wonderful. Um, I'd like to just follow up on the question that you asked because I was thinking of similar attempts in India to um, host uh, events that bring together artists and scientists to talk around, say, climate change. Mm -hmm. And um, they do try to be more public, but yes. that usually means that fairly, you know, sophisticated conceptual art gets performed in public spaces. So on the mm -hmm. beach in Chennai, or in a you know city in the middle of the city in some public space in Delhi. Yeah. And by and large, it leaves most ordinary people completely mystified. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just wondering whether. Um, you know, in, in Delhi, at least, it seems to me that some of these attempts to get a conversation going tend to be 
patronizing to a certain extent because the forms of art that we think um, are appropriate, uh, in fact, have no resonance emotionally or intellectually with most of the people out there. You know, it's, it's just a different vocabulary well, well, I mean, and language altogether. Sure. I'm wondering whether you had similar questions in South Africa with this. Um, no, um, not like that. Um, and I'm just thinking that through. You know, of course, conceptual art, and Nuttall Wellers was a good example of that, that, mm -hmm. that I showed you, um, who's shown his work at Cochin at the Biennale and so on. Um, but what it did do, I mean, we had mi mining industry there appalled and a number of mining engineers and students saying, oh my God, look at this, this you know. So, I mean, you know, you change where you can. And I don't think that in this any more than, you know, work that I do in my day job, I'm going to change, um, I'm not going to change global health and I'm not going to change global warming. I'm interested in the interventions where I can be affected and what that might do. And as I said, I mean, this, is just be, this has been a privileged moment um, in terms of having access to resources to be curating and producing rather than doing research and being ground by <coughs> the rhythms of a grant cycle and the writing of academic papers. Um, there, there are, I think that what happens though is that this kind of intervention does provide a new moment to begin to question what's going on and there is a big question around infrastructure which is why plumbing liked it. Um, or like what I wrote, but really seriously, you know, it's, it, this is a drought, there's always been droughts in South Africa. Um, the problem is that the, is that the African continent is warming up at twice the rate of the rest of the world. So it is an urgency and I think that the more people who, who are making noises in the ways that they can best do, um, but, you know, I'm entirely the wrong person to be going from village to village trying to change community attitudes or to provide outreach or anything else. You know, you, any of us work where we are and I think, you know, the argument around, well, uh, you know, that kind of art is elitist and, you know, one could say, I think, of, you know, the, the same for the art that Kath's shown is, mm, and so is academic production. And we're, we're not saying, well, you know, no one's ever going to read my paper, therefore it's not worth writing at all. And it is part of, I mean, how, you know, both work and the sharing of ideas move. And, uh, and I think that what Sharad's done in, in today's programming has get us, <coughs> got us to think in different ways about how we understand the environment and how we relate to it and talk about it and how we read that environment. Um, well, if I may clarify, sorry, I wasn't trying to oppose academic production and artistic production, but I was asking about whether in the debate around, um, you know, modes of representation, artistic representation in South Africa, whether this, um, whether there's an, there's an attempt to, you know, make the art itself more inclusive by maybe, you know, identifying art differently and looking at different kinds of producers of art. Well, there is, there is multiple just, producers. Uh, sorry. The, some of you just, did you have something on yes. this slide? Yeah, but please yeah. finish the yeah. 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 Go yeah. on and I'll okay. take yeah. that yeah. together. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Well, the other, other way, and I thought actually on this question was really interesting for us to think with, because the other kind of question I had, maybe even a worry, is, you know, a lot of this art is very capital intensive in every sense of the term. They take, it takes a lot to produce. Not all, but a lot of it. I also wonder about the materials that are being used, what happens, what is the afterlife. But for the artist, I also wonder who's collecting this art. Mm. Right? This has become a big issue in the art world for this kind of you know, they produce these, some of, you know, these kind of giant things, but they are not being collected. There is, so the artist, how does the artist then continue to sustain his or her practice? So there's all of these kinds of issues as well, in addition to the legibility question, which is what you're mm. asking, right? I mean, there's, mm. it is often not legible to anybody other than a very small select circle. And answer could be that modern and contemporary art has always been that. 
Mm. It, or in, in, in our parts of the world, mm. excuse me, in India, right? That it always, you know, when it goes out into the public, it gets into trouble. And then, you know, artists mm. are banned, artworks are banned, and all this happens. So, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm going to go in another direction. Because oh, right. do you want so, to? Well, no, because what's interesting is part of, I was part of this Ford Foundation Institutional Change Project for six years. Yes. And one of the things we did, and I worked very closely in my region, which was Iowa, which was yes. extremely rural, very poor, extremely poor. And actually, part of our project was to actually get students from school upwards to come and be part of conceptual art projects, mm. right? So it was really interesting that the state legislature was very radical. They didn't say we want legible art. What they said <laughs> is we want things to be as illegible as possible, or legible if need be, <laughs> and actually want kids. So part of our, and it came actually from native practices, right, mm -hmm. working with First Nations folk, mm -hmm. where art is part of the classroom. So it's actually integrating and not imagining people who have no capital, to have mm -hmm. no access to intellectual mm -hmm. conceptuality, because that's part of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting, I was thinking about the two things, two instances of public art, Chiba's work, yeah, so on water. Work too, yeah. And what was very interesting, so the first one, Kath and I were there at it, and it was in the public library mm -hmm. in Old Delhi, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's a library people come to. Mm -hmm. But I also realized, like, I have a very, I'm actually, I do natural sciences. So it was interesting, all these kids were coming in from the street, complete fucking little street thugs, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, they were like, and I started talking to them about the piece, which is very conceptual, but has material bits. And it was amazing. All these kids started coming in and finding things, mm -hmm. right? And then she had a massive project at the Hauda Dilad Museum, which is, which is actually for the Crystal Palace exhibition. I mean, it's one of the mm. museums that stores the second yeah. places. And again, what I found, I mean, it was interesting. Like, actually, it was really, so there was one project in the, she had a, the Yamuna series. Yes. And there were seven farmers sitting in front of that, those installations for s two or three hours trying to figure it out, but also ending up talking to each other. So I actually started talking to them. Mm -hmm. And I said, is this difficult for you? And what they said it was that it was like turning farming into poetry. Mm -hmm. And it was so, you know, so I think, I mean, partly what I'm asking about is because, because I've been involved with the mm -hmm. publicness of, um, uh, of, since the 1990s, yeah. right? Actually, public art, mm -hmm. right? And part of, it's part of education is like, would you, I mean, one of the ways to do it is to integrate a kind of playful practice mm -hmm. um, into conceptual art, mm -hmm. you know? So, especially little kids are great, mm -hmm. right? They'll mm -hmm. draw, they'll ask questions, they'll say, what's this empty space? What's this noise? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, partly one of the things we did, uh, I started doing a lot is having kids of different ages. Mm. You know, because the little ones are just mm. incredible. Um, so, like, if you, yeah. that, I mean, it might be an interesting way. Well, I mean, not so much brown, but it fits a lot of the artwork and some of our, of the academic program was in the Origin Centre Museum. And the Origin Centre Museum is the rock art museum for the yeah. country. Oh, that's interesting. And normally it costs a lot to go into it. Yeah. If, but it was open for schools for the two weeks of watershed. Yes, and so, so people came in and yeah. then also engaged with the art. And the rest of it is that we made sure that we had a really good wall labels there you have, because yeah. then you've got context. But now, yeah. but to go back you know, to your question. point, yeah. I mean, one, artists of all kinds are concerned about sustainability. Yeah. And yes, art it's can be true. expensive, but that is, you know, you can't, although most of my people worked with sound with found objects, most mm -hmm. of my people. Sorry, that sounds so appropriating. It's horrible. <laughs> but um, it was not expensive, um, most of it. You know, getting scaffolding to hang Uttle's work cost a fortune, <coughs> but the rest of it was pretty cheap. The And, you know, like the Pandukas cost him $20, you know, per Panduka from, from a miner who made a couple of dollars a day from mining, you know, at three kilometres under the below the earth's surface so um, there are, there are a number of art sustainability movements mm -hmm. and there is concern mm -hmm. 
Um, but on the other hand, the answer is not to say, well, we'll only have um, artwork if it's e.g. digital. Well, digital yeah. also costs. It does. Um, how do you retain it? We, we videoed and photographed this. The photographs were pretty crap, but the videos are wonderful. So at least it's in the archive. Mm -hmm. Some of the art, Christine Dixie's work on fracking has, has gone to the South Museum, so they took it. Um, I mean, they were delighted they got it for free because we paid for its printing anyway. Um, other work was has gone back to artists, and I think there's always that's the problem anyway with any artwork. Yeah. What happens to it? But it's yeah. also, of course, true for any academic work. You know, I mean, we we've, we've for most of our lives use trees to print off drafts of papers and, and everything else and generated, you know, thousands and thousands of forests worth of, of papers and journals that, you know, so that's an ongoing <laughs> question. But um, it, it, is, it is around, um, I'm just going to tell you one thing and then I'll shut up. And then people can, I'm standing between you and drinks now. One of, the, one of the things I do, which is completely inconsistent with my life as a medical anthropologist and my life doing this, is that I teach with Brown a course that really began on environment and the art. And because the course is taught within a degree, which is an executive MBA, it, you know, I didn't want them to be thinking, oh God, <laughs> you know, so I made it practical. And therefore, at the end of this course, short course, it's this unit that they do with me, they have to come up with an intervention for their own industry. It's not about art. I mean, most of these people are um, capital C, capitalist kind of people, but a lot of them are NGOs and so on. <laughs> but I want to tell you, sorry, I'm going, to, I'm going to stop. I really want to tell you about this one project because it happened. <laughs> one of the people who did the MBA with me last year was general manager of Omaha Opera. Well, opera <laughs> is more resource intensive than any other art form in the it's Western true. canon. It's outrageous, you know. It's true. And people get fancy costumes and they never it's wear them again ridiculous. and so on. <laughs> However, and, and all of their job, each year these students have to come up with an intervention to reduce their footprint on the earth. Mm. You know, mm. I mean, it's not, not said that sloppily, but that's what it's about. So, this, this general manager worked out where... He went for, you know, the, the easy picking fruit, the low hanging fruit, and he worked out that he could have a definable impact simply in terms of the, co the petrol fumes of people driving to artwork and mm, to, to operas and to theatre and everything else. So Brilliant. he did a deal with the local public transport authority in Omaha, and they now have a ticket called Green. Go Verdi, V-E-R-D-I, Go Verdi, <laughs> and you can buy a Go Verdi ticket and travel on public transport and see any cultural thing in the city and you this leave your car at home. It's really, in Omaha is really interesting. Well, that's it's it, really that's what yeah. they did. So, Lenore, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> <That's brilliant. Yeah. laughs>